Back in 2010, while scrolling around in some since-forgotten corner of the internet, I stumbled across a game created in RPG Maker which was uploaded to Game Jolt with a simple but enticing description. Philip and the Leg Horse set off on a strange and deadly mission to find the legendary city of Forms from which all things in the world are derived. On their travels, they must overcome ghosts, criminals, hypnosis, lions, draculas, cryptic letters, muscle hedonists, swamp knights, mysterious caves, blood ghouls, grotesque monsters, purple drink, and more in order to discover the secret of Space Funeral. A shortish RPG Maker 2003 game with original graphics, a soundtrack of creaky vintage electronica and obscure Japanese noise rock, and lots of blood. Arrow keys walk, Z interacts, X opens menu, standalone download, please play plus give me crits, thank you. Space Funeral, one of the countless projects created by indie game darling Stephen Gilmurphy, aka the Catamites, was released onto the world on September 17th, 2010. A unique blend of nostalgia for SNES-era RPGs, obscure and disturbing horror comedy, and a repurposed soundtrack dripping in retro angst psychedelia, Space Funeral immediately gained the attention of many an internet critic and player alike. Quickly, the game spawned a pocket community of fellow intellectuals, who shared memes relating to the game and the Catamites' influence spread further than it had reached with earlier efforts. Over the coming years, the Catamites would continue to produce a multitude of games spanning numerous genres and several game engines. Their games contain a unique sense of space and surreal reality, where each project contains its own logic that is unbending to its audience. When you boot up a game developed by the Catamites, you're in their world for better or worse. Space Funeral's influence extended beyond the game and its initial wave of fanfare and memory. The Catamites themselves never returned to the series, but would be called back to the franchise, as the fans quickly turned it into a franchise with fan sequels coming fast and loose. During the height of this growth and popularity, I wasn't engaged with any of it. I had mostly forgotten about Space Funeral as my old PC broke down and I moved on to mostly console gaming. Yet, for all of those years, the images and characters and incidents within Space Funeral had stuck with me. And they had all been linked to one song. One piece of music that felt emblematic of the whole experience. The first piece of music you hear upon beginning the game, in fact. Well, once you get past the main menu. White Waking by Le Rari de Nude. In the decades since first discovering the song, I spent a little bit of time here and there looking into the band behind this song. I listened to a few of their albums, and I saw a few of their recorded performances. Last year, I came across the song for the first time in a while, which got me interested in the band once again. This time, I dove headfirst into researching the mysterious past of Le Rari de Nude, and quickly learned that this quaint, chance encounter back in 2010 had set us on a path down one of the longest, deepest rabbit holes we've encountered in the history of running this channel. Immediately, we knew we would be making this video to investigate a few key questions. So join us today as we investigate. Who were Le Rari de Nude? Who is Ethan Mosique? And how does a band with only a few official recordings from before the advent of digital media have a discography most musicians would envy in the SoundCloud and Bandcamp era? Let's go, everybody, as we crawl together down the rabbit hole of one of Japan's most legendary bands, Le Rari de Nude. According to legend, Le Rari de Nude is a name with no meaning. Supposedly, it began as a bastardization of the empty suitcases in French. As we'll soon see, the French language plays an important part in the background of the band, so this checks out. As with more or less everything about the band, which we'll also soon learn, this origin for their name is just conjecture. Rock writer Julian Cope claims instead that the band's name was a corruption of Valide de Nude, a fake French slang term coined by a 1960s theater troupe, Gendai Gekijo. In this telling, the troupe invented the term to mean someone who's an airhead or an idiot. Supposedly, Takashi Mizutani, the head of the band, stole the name from Gendai Gekijo and corrupted it into the Japanese term Hadaka no Rarizu, the naked Rari. As we'll encounter multiple times throughout this deep dive, so much information and conjecture surrounding the band's name has been copied and pasted from site to site across the internet. To make matters worse, it's often unsourced making us question what's real and what is not. 
One of the few sources which purports to be definitive, the aforementioned Julian Cope book, Japrock Sampler, is suspect at best. According to an article published by Red Bull Music Academy, the Japanese edition of this book has a disclaimer concerning the veracity of the book's claims. Some commentators on the book have called into question some stories concerning the bands covered, specifically Le Rai de Nude. In the English-speaking world, the band was properly introduced in 1999 by Dr. Alan Cummings, a professor at the University of London. We mention Dr. Cummings here because of not only his knowledge on the band for decades before this introduction, but also because he seems to laugh at Cope's work on Le Rari de Nude, meaning that one of the few trusted English-language sources for information on the group denies by proxy some of the more often passed around claims into their history. We had the privilege of contacting Dr. Cummings in the course of researching this video. He was gracious enough to provide us some insight into the band from his wealth of knowledge concerning their history and catalog. It was truly a pleasure speaking with Dr. Cummings as he demystified certain elements of the Re Rari de Nude story for us. Dr. Cummings commented that he's unsure where Julian Cope may have gotten some of his more fantastical stories concerning the band, but that his coverage of them at least brought newfound interest in the English-speaking world. In other words, while Cope may have served to convolute the story of Le Rari de Nude, he also provided a boon to their popularity in the 21st century. Also, please note, I do not speak French. I do not know French. I am sorry that I am inevitably pronouncing this incorrectly. Thank you for your understanding. Supposedly, four influences converged to create the legendary band, crashing into one another and leaving behind a disheveled mess that shuffled off as Le Rari de Nude. According to the aforementioned book by Cope, so, you know, take this with a grain of salt, in creating the band, leading man Takashi Mizutani drew on his interest in French literature, the revolutionary fervor bubbling in the Japanese university system in the 1960s, Blue Cheer's album, Vincibus Eruptum, and the Velvet Underground's album, White Light Slash White Heat. Mizutani agreed with Lou Reed, head of the Velvet Underground, on disliking the hippie movement, meaning that the band's music tends more towards nihilism than the free love and optimism of earlier alt-rock. Needless to say, the original sound of Le Rari de Nude was already distilled and yet rough enough that some pointed them for inspiring and opening the door for experimental, noisy bands and artists from Japan to gain international popularity in the 80s and 90s. We're getting ahead of ourselves though. Let's jump back a few decades. In 1967, Takashi Mizutani founded Re Rari at Doshisha University in Kyoto at 19 years of age. Other original band members included Moriaki Wakabayashi on bass, Takashi Kato on drums, and Takeshi Nakamura on rhythm guitar. Admittedly, this lineup, well, let's just say it didn't remain consistent. We'll get there. Originally, Re Rari de Nude intended to work on folk music in the Kyoto College and folk music scene. See, around the same time, over in Tokyo, a psychedelic folk band known as Jax was making a splash. Their lead, Yoshio Hayakawa, was known to not provide interviews. Supposedly, Mizutani and company wished to be outsider artists who pushed the envelope in terms of misanthropy and mystery further than Jax. Admittedly though, this is another claim not corroborated by any accounts other than that provided by Cope. The following year, 1968, saw the band recording a studio demo. A demo which Mizutani reportedly hated thanks to its garage sound. Mizutani wanted to emulate Velvet Underground and Blue Cheer, hence his disappointment with this direction. In turn, he took them in a more ambient, psychedelic direction. Julian Cope has helped spread this narrative, saying that this whole debacle was partially the fault of Gendai Gekijo member Tatsuo Komatsu, neglecting to truly help with the recording and engineering of the demo. And who were Gendai Gekijo? Well, they were a theater troupe employed by the band to assist in providing a more unique air to the band's early live performances, by offering light shows which Mizutani called Total Sensory Assault. Over time, they grew into their own in live settings, in turn dropping the theater angle, though they continued to employ Total Sensory Assault. Additionally, it should be noted that the affectation of foregoing interviews and using French slang was stolen as well from Gendai Gekijo. As with everything else in this video, only one source really claims this. We should also mention that the band was supposedly attached to Shuji Teriyama's troupe as well. 
Terayama being an avant-garde stage director who successfully made a career in film as well throughout the 60s and 70s. This is also reported without citation all over the internet, and seems a bit sketchy since Terayama was in Tokyo while Mizutani's band were in Kyoto. In 19... nice 69... <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. In 1969... nice. The band made their first major splash when they played Barricades A Go-Go, a concert coinciding with a student occupation of and protest within Kyoto University. These types of protests and occupations had occurred throughout the decade in multiple major Japanese universities, though we can't comment on how many had their own accompanying concerts. This type of effort helped boost the band's credibility, with Barricades A Go Go credited as having a major impact on the underground Kansai rock scene. Shortly after the performance, rhythm guitarist Nakamura quit the band, and bassist Wakabayashi began to go in and out. It was at this point that Gendai Gekijo dropped out as well, concerned with the immense volume Mizutani and company employed at their shows, as well as the direction in which the band was moving. At the same time, Tatsuo Komatsu, a member of Gendai Gekijo, became the band's manager, meaning that at least one troop member would continue to influence their course. Seemingly, he didn't last long, however, as he allegedly grew annoyed by Mizutani's treatment of interviews. After all, if Mizutani wouldn't promote the band, it was as good as dead in the water, right? Before we continue, we want to cut in for a moment here and tell you all about an exciting new affiliation we've garnered here on Cinema Nippon. Are you in the market for some Japanese study materials? Maybe some cute lifestyle or fashion items? Perhaps some imported Japanese snacks? then check out OMG Japan, your source for all of this and more. This site is pretty exciting for us, as it not only offers goods from Japan, but perhaps more interestingly, the site offers some unique Japanese language study materials. They've got your Genkis and your Somatomes and your new Kans and Masters, all of which are great choices, whether you're starting out with Japanese or you're studying for all of your end tests. OMG Japan is also your primary source for these nifty flashcards produced by White Rabbit Press. These come in sets of both kana and kanji, so they're great for any level of Japanese study. We've personally used these cards in the past, and we have to say they're super convenient for learning a bunch of both readings and associated words for any given kanji. If you're interested in any of these or more, be sure to use our affiliate link in the description of this video, and we'll get a kickback for any purchase you make through OMG Japan. So you can get your snack on and your learning on while also supporting the channel. Now, back to the show. As the 1970s dawned, the band is reported to have moved from Kyoto to Tokyo to improve their chances of success. By Cope's account, this move was made to avoid the eyes of both the CIA and Japanese national observations. This would have happened thanks to a teensy little incident we'll be getting to in just a moment. Turnover drastically increased within the band as the new decade began, and continued as the years rolled on, with at least 15, if not more, members coming and going before the band allegedly dissolved. At some points, the band is even supposed to have played without Mizutani, much to his chagrin. Around the time of this move to Tokyo, Mizutani may have toyed with the idea of converting the band to an acoustic outfit, though, as per usual, this is not confirmed. So, about that little incident we mentioned. Well, 1970 wasn't all sunshine and rainbows for the blossoming band. As the star of Le Rari Denu De was rising, original bassist Moriaki Wakabayashi, one of several thousand bassists who played for the band over the years, partook in the hijacking of a Japanese airliner. Is it actually- are you making a joke here? Were there actually thousands of people who played in this band? Is this a joke? Wakabayashi's involvement is said to have had a negative impact on the band's image given their association. Wakabayashi was a member of the Japanese Red Army Faction, a communist militant group, several of whom took over Japanese Airlines Flight 351 on March 31st, 1970, in what became known as the Yodogo Incident. After hijacking the flight, they rerouted it to Pyongyang, North Korea, where they successfully landed and were allowed to continue living. More on this later. Allegedly, Mizutani was asked to help with the jacking, but refused. Whether this allegation holds water, all reports agree that his connection with Wakabayashi caused controversy for the band and converted Mizutani into a hermit thanks to his communist sympathies and fear of government pursuit. 
Between 1970 and 1992, the band produced plenty of recordings and performed many shows while keeping news and interviews more or less non-existent. They played the Rock in Highland Festival in 1970, and were blamed when festival attendance was low. In 1971, Mizutani contributed to the debut album of Masato Minami, Kaikisen, aka The Tropics. This album went on to win critical favor with Cope claiming this album's success pissed Mizutani off due to his own sinking star and the band's poisoned name. Due to this bitterness, and the fear of retribution for the Yorigo incident, Mizutani allegedly became a total recluse in Tokyo at this point, only occasionally playing at Oz. Oz was an important club venue for the band, providing the setting for one of their better known records. Unfortunately, Oz was shuttered in September 1973, though employees of Oz like Doronko helped the band even after it shut down. Doronko in particular became a part of the band's ever-revolving lineup, playing bass for them from time to time. Ironically, as the band became more obscure, their sound and profile became more set. According to Liner Notes, author Rosa Brindis Einarstadter, and I have no idea how to say that, so once again, apologies, in one of their later releases, around 1973 or 1974, their style began to solidify with songs like The Last One and Enter the Mirror, first coming to fruition. This author also claims that in the 1970s, Mizutani layered upon effects pedals and other sound modulation devices, even making his own effects boxes, another move which came to define their sound. On that note, we should mention that many find it hard to say exactly what certain recordings from the band were produced, though fans and bootleg labels alike will try to nail down specific years for live recordings. You'll notice that throughout this video we've made references to the band's massive output, but that their first album wasn't released until 1992. The story goes that the band were set to record an album for Virgin in 1976, with the label misnaming them to The Naked Larrys, supposedly. Though, this record deal fell through due to Mizutani's discontent and perfectionism getting in the way. Another attempt at recording was said to happen about a decade later in the late 80s, though this is not corroborated either. Amidst these failed records and continued struggles for relevance, Mizutani and company were occasionally assembled for live shows all over the place throughout the 1970s, though their popularity was more or less gone by now, according to Cope. Band member rotation accelerated in this period, intensifying again in the 1980s, with the band often appearing as a trio, or sometimes even a duo. In the 1980s, Mizutani even got so fed up with the band's continued lack of success that he ran away to France for half a decade, where he played with the saxophonist Arthur Doyle. Or so the story goes. That's gonna wrap it up for the first part of this exploration into Le Rari de Nade. This video is already lengthy enough, and we figured it better to split the proceedings into two parts. So join us again in a few weeks when we'll be delving into the later years of the band's career, the years since their dissolution, and a bit more about the Yorigo incident. We had some more to examine with regards to the hijacking, but thought it messed with the flow too much to spend half of this video discussing it. Believe us though, you do not want to miss the depths and intricacies of that rabbit hole. In the meantime, if you're itching to learn more about the band, be sure to check out the video on Le Rari de Nude by dissecting the disco. They explore the band from some other perspectives, including musically which is something we're not equipped at all to do, so if you're interested in learning about the band's sound, be sure to give this one a look. Thanks everyone for four years of support here on Cinema Nippon. See you soon, and have a nice day.